So in this work example, we're going to conceptualize the distribution of means. This is part one of chapter five. And in this chapter, we focus on hypothesis testing with sample sizes greater than one. So we're now going to begin to work with sample sizes of greater than one to test hypotheses that the mean of a sample is larger, smaller, or different from scores for a known population. And there are really just two things that we're focusing on learning in this chapter. The first is the distribution of means. Instead of using the distribution of individuals, we'll compare our sample mean, our sample score, to a distribution of means, and we'll learn about the characteristics of this distribution. And secondly, the main characteristic that we'll learn about is how to calculate the spread or the standard deviation for the distribution of means. And this is what we do in step two when we're defining the comparison distribution. So we're gonna have a different measure of spread. So previously, we were doing z-tests comparing individuals to groups of individuals, like your IQ score to a group of individuals' IQ scores. But the problem is this we know that one individual isn't really representative of the population. Like if we draw a person at random out of this sample, I mean, all we can generalize to is people like this person. And so in order to make it good research, we really have to use groups of people or more than one person. So what we are doing now is we're going to be drawing groups of individuals from the sample. So we've drawn out this guy from the sample and this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy. This is our sample. And we drew all of these people from the population. And so now these people will represent the population and will, if we do something different to them, we'll assume that these people might be in some way different from the population. At least that's what our research hypothesis would be. But if we took the average score on whatever we're measuring um, for this group of individuals, so we took the mean and we compared it to the scores for all these groups of individuals, it would not be fair. And so let's look at why this is. So here's a scenario I'm going to use to explain the concept behind the distribution of means, and maybe it will make sense to you. Then we'll get into the actual calculations. So bear with me with this example. Imagine that you have a team of runners, two runners on your team, and the first runner ran a race in five minutes right here, and the second ran the race in 11 minutes. And then all of the other runners made these times. So opponent one was nine, 10, nine, seven, nine, eight, eight, seven, six, eight, seven, 11. That's the distribution for the population. If we were to draw this out, we could see that the fastest runner ran it in five minutes. So if we were gonna draw out this distribution, we see that we have scores ranging from five, six minutes, seven minutes, eight, nine, 10, 11, and I think that's as high as we go. And we can see that the lowest score of all is this one right here, five minutes. And so we can conclude that this person is the winner because her score is lower than everyone else's score. We were gonna plot this out. We put her score here. We put the 11 minutes right here. And then we would plot out all of these other scores. We'd plot out the, the nine, the 10, the nine, the seven, the nine, the eight, the eight, the seven, the six, the eight, the seven, and the 11. And so this would be our distribution for this particular population. But the judges decide they're going to do something different. Instead of saying runner one is the winner, yay, they're going to say, well, we're gonna take the average of your team score and compare it with all these individuals. 
So they calculate the average 11 plus 5 equals 16 divided by 2 equals 8. And they say, okay, we're going to take this 8 and we're going to compare your score of 8 to this group of individuals. Well, you can see right now that it's not fair because the fastest runner was this number one runner with five minutes. And if we have to take their average of two people, then we should be comparing it with averages of two people, not with the average of all these winners. It just wouldn't be fair. And so what we would have to do to make it fair would be to take and take all of the pairs that we can think of, all of the pairs that we can find out of this population and plot those scores. So let's say we drew two people at random out of here. Let's take opponent one and opponent four, and we had a seven and a nine. The average of seven and nine is eight. And so now instead of the seven and nine, I'm gonna draw in green, we have an eight. I'll draw a little box here. Now we're gonna take two more people at random. Let's take opponent six and opponent three. Eight plus nine, is 17 divided by 2 is 8.5. Let's put that score right here. Let's draw another pair, opponent 5 and opponent 4, 9 and 7 again. 9 plus 7 equals 16 divided by 2 equals 8. Let's plot that. And at random, let's keep drawing pairs, opponent 10 and opponent 8. 8 and 7 is 15 divided by 2 equals 7.5. Let's plot that score right here. 11 and 12. If we were in a classroom, we could do this together. Um, we have this opponent 11 and opponent 12. 11 plus 7 equals 18 divided by 2 equals 9. Let's plot the 9. Let's take opponent 9 and opponent 7. We have six and eight. Eight plus six equals 14, divided by two equals seven. Let's plot the seven. And you can see here that it would be more fair to plot to compare our score, our pair score with other pairs. And so we can't compare a pair of scores with a group of individuals because it's not fair. If we were going to continue to compare all of these scores, we would discover that the mean score for this group is likely to stay the mean score when we draw pairs of individuals. And we would also find that it would be highly unlikely to have any pair that equal the lowest score, the five. And it would be highly unlikely to have any pair that would equal this highest score of 11 we really are quite likely to have scores that are in the middle. So if our first distribution was shaped something like this, then our distribution of means in green would be skinnier because in order to get, there's only one possible way to get the scores um, in the tail, we'd have to draw that runner who got five minutes twice. And so it's very, un and so as we compare pairs of pairs instead of individuals, we find that the distribution, um, the center of the distribution stays about the same, but the distribution gets narrower. And I don't know if this helps. There's a lot of ways of demonstrating this when we're in class, and your book describes this pretty nicely on page. Let's see here, the very start of chapter five, so you can kind of read how they try and help you conceptualize it, and I recommend reading it. But we're gonna continue on to look at the characteristics of the distribution of means so that we can work with it. So the distribution of means, again, is just the distribution of randomly chosen groups from within our population, randomly chosen groups of the same size as our sample. So it's the mean scores of randomly chosen samples 
the same size are equal to our sample of interest. So in this case, our sample of interest was two. We had two runners. And so we needed to draw many pairs of two out of our sample, calculate the mean. And when we plot all those means on a distribution, that is called the distribution of means. So what are the characteristics of the distribution of means? Well, first off, let's review the distribution of means is the distribution. So when we say distribution, you can picture that um, normal curve or something like that. So it is the distribution that results when a large number of samples of a given size are drawn from a population and the mean scores for each sample are plotted. So we just did that on the previous slide when we drew out those pairs of runners and plotted their mean scores. The central limit theorem refers to the three rules for determining the key characteristics of a distribution of means. So this is, we don't have to use this phrase a lot, but you might see it and it's good if you know what it is. So let's get the pen to work here. Um, so the central limit theorem is the kind of rules that describe the distribution of means. And rule one is center. So you'll remember that we're in, when we're in step two, we have three things that we need to do to describe the comparison distribution. And we talk about the spread, the center, and the shape. And so what are those rules for doing step two when we're using sample sizes larger than one? Well, we first describe the center and it's still the, just defined by the mean. But the sampling distribution or the distribution of means, mu for the distribution of means is the symbol, is going to be the same for the mean for the population of individuals. So there's no change. The mean for the population of the distribution of means is the same as the mean for the population of individuals. The standard deviation, we have a little bit of a change because the standard deviation gets smaller when we're working with a distribution of means. The formula is here. It's just the square root of the variance of the population divided by the sample size for right now. And there's also these different names for it. And we're going to tease this out more in subsequent slides. So I'm not even going to write this formula out right now. And finally, Rule three is the shape. We assume that the distribution of means is normally distributed. For our class, whenever you write down shape, you can write the name of the distribution and just write normal. Okay? The official rules are that we can only say normal if n is greater than 30 or if the population is normally distributed. But we're not going to stress about that. We'll, we'll know it. Now you've heard it. But we're just going to say normal because for all our examples, we're going to say normal. So rule one, the center, there is no change. You're still going to write mu. The shape, no change. You're still going to write normal. The spread, we're going to use a formula that we'll define in the subsequent slides. But first, we're just going to look a little more closely at shape on the next slide. So I'm showing you this, which might look like a lot, just by way of giving you the conceptual background for the distribution of means and why we assume normal. So if we start with a distribution of individuals that is um, normally distributed, then we can see as we follow down when we have different sample sizes, n equals 3, we have n equals 5, n equals 10 and n equals 20. That means the number in the sample. We can see that they're all still normal. And we can also notice that the spread decreases. Here is the spread here, pretty wide. And look at when we have n equals 3. It's quite a bit narrower. By the time we get down to n equals 10, it's quite skinny. 
So the spread decreases or the standard deviation decreases, but the shape stays normal. The center stays the same. Now let's imagine that we have a population distribution that's skewed, like um, uh, we looked at a lot of skewed distributions earlier, like ages of people in elementary school or something like that. We might have many more who are younger. And we can see that the mean, as we know, in a skewed distribution is a little off center, right? But notice what happens when we draw samples. When we draw samples of three, the mean stays in the same place. We can still detect a little bit of skew. When we draw samples of five, the mean stays in the same place, and we can detect still a little bit of skew. By the time we get 10, the mean is still in the same place. The skew is disappearing. And that's what happens when we draw samples out of a population distribution. We can also see once again that the spread is decreasing. So once again, we see that the spread decreases, the mean stays the same, and the shape becomes normal as the sample size increases. If we start with a uniform distribution, like as if we were to roll one pair of dice, I mean one dice, we know we have equal chances of getting one, two, three, four, five, six. If we rolled three dices and calculated the mean score for these three dices, we would get a nice, wide, normally distributed, look at the shape, distribution. The mean score is still the same. As we continue to get larger sample sizes, we can see the shape is still normal, the mean is still in the center, but the standard deviation is shrinking. And that same continues to be true as we get larger sample sizes. We're just less likely to get extreme scores when we calculate the means for larger sample sizes. And even if we have a super messy, irregular distribution like this one, here's the mean. Okay. Now we have sample sizes of three drawn out of this messy distribution and we've plotted them all out, look what happens. Even with sample sizes is three, we begin to get a normal distribution with a mean in the same place, pretty widespread. As we draw sample sizes of five out, we get mean stays the same, the shape stays the same, and here's our spread getting narrower. So that simply explains to you why the central limit theorem applies. So again, the three rules of the central limit theorem are that the mu for the distribution of means is the same as the mu for individuals. That's this line that we drew. The mean stays the same. We can write that the shape, as long as we have enough in the sample, it's going to be normal. And we'll, we have to, that's the center, and the spread will be narrower. So now we're going to define the comparison distribution. Um, that is the main step that's changing in what we're doing in our work today. So the example that we're going to have is one in which the comparison distribution has a mean of 50. And we know that that mean is represented by the symbol mu and the standard deviation of 10 represented by the lowercase sigma. We have to define it in the three steps that we've used all along, center, shape, and spread. The center for the distribution is going to be the mean for the distribution of means, which we indicate with that little subtext M. Don't put it above, it goes below. It's the same as the standard, as the mu for the distribution of means. And we know from the central limit theorem and from we just had that that's going to be the same as mu for the population of individuals. So for this part of the comparison distribution, we simply go into the problem, look for mu, and that's all we write here. The shape is always going to be a Z distribution in this set of examples. 
and it's always going to be normal. That's an assumption we work with in this class, and we won't be going beyond that. So you can always just write normal. So here, no change, no change. For spread, we're going to look a little more closely at the formula. So the formula for spread, um, I'm going to write it out now, is the standard deviation. And the standard deviation for the distribution of means is this formula. Standard deviation for the distribution of means is to write the whole, whole formula out at once is the square root of the variance divided by n. And this is how we're calculating it now. But in our class, we're always going to be using three steps. Step one, we're going to calculate the variance. And the variance is always going to be standard deviation squared. In step two, we're going to calculate the variance for the distribution of means. There's that subtext m again. And it's going to always equal the variance, which we just calculated up here. This is the same thing, divided by n, or the number in the sample. And in step three, we're going to calculate the standard deviation for the distribution of means, which is always going to be the square root of the variance for the distribution of means. There are some different terms that you'll see. I'm going to show them to you and then tell, we, tell you what we'll be using. So variance is the same as what we're going to write as variance, V-A-R like that. And in your book, they use sigma squared. I've never liked that because when you're a beginning statistics student, this always suggests that you should be doing something and it makes it confusing. So I'm going to always be using VAR variance when I give examples. Secondly, the standard deviation for the distribution of means, standard deviation for the distribution of means, or of sampling means, if you want to get really complicated, or in other words, standard deviation for the distribution of means, is sometimes written as standard error, or abbreviated SE, or sometimes written as standard error for the distribution of means, SEM. In our class, for the sake of consistency, I'm usually going to use standard deviation for the distribution of means written this way, but I want you to know that so that you can more easily interpret your book. Let's go ahead and apply this formula now to calculate spread for n equals 2. Let's follow these three steps that we've just identified. So step one, we have to calculate variance, which is sigma squared and sigma is given right here, standard deviation equals 10 squared equals 100. Next, we calculate VARM, the variance for the distribution of means, is variance divided by n equals 10 divided by 2 equals 5. A little crunched in there. And for step 3, I'll move it over a little, we're going to take this we're going to calculate sigma for the distribution of means, which equals the square root of the variance for the distribution of means, which is the square root of 5, which equals, we get out our calculator at times like this, or our spreadsheet, and we discover that it equals, um, this should have been 50, and this should have been 50, and we discovered that it equals 7.07. .07. And that's what we write here. The standard deviation for the distribution of means is 7.07. .07. We can follow the same steps for calculating spread for this next example. Center will not be changed. Shape will not be changed. So we don't even need to rewrite those. We can just calculate spread. So in this case, we'll follow the same set of examples. 
we'll first calculate variance. Variance still equals 100 because the standard deviation hasn't squared changed. The variance for the distribution of means equals variance over n equals 100 over 10 equals 10. And finally, standard deviation for the distribution of means is the square root of the variance for the distribution of means is the square root of 10, which equals 3.1. Six. So in this case, standard deviation for the distribution of means is 3.16. And if we go through the very same process for n equals 30, we'll discover that the standard deviation for the distribution of means is 1.83. And you'll see if you look closely that we first have a 7.07, .07, next we have a 3.16 and a 1.83. We can see that as n increases, sigma m decreases. And that illustrates what we saw earlier, which is the distribution narrowing as the sample sizes got larger. So in conclusion, um, in chapter four, we compared a sample of one individual, n equals one, with a population of individual scores. In chapter five, we compare samples greater than one individuals with a distribution of sampling means. And those means are the same size, the same number of individuals as in the sample. And we know that larger sample sizes produce narrower spread resulting in smaller standard deviations. They don't change the mean and they yield an increasingly normal shape. The larger the sample, the more normal the, sh the shape of the distribution. Um, and finally, we know that the spread for the distribution of means in our class will be calculated in three steps. We'll first calculate the variance by taking the standard deviation squared. Then we'll calculate the variance for the distribution of means, um, which is the variance divided by n. And then we'll get the standard deviation for the distribution of means, sigma m, which will be the square root of the variance for the distribution of means. So in our next content, we'll continue on to do some examples.